Hello, good morning. Today our guest is economist Ger Germinal Van. Hello, Germinal. How are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm great, Germinal. So, Germinal, tell us a little about yourself. Where are you from? So, I am uh, originally from the Ivory Coast, which is a uh, French-speaking country in West Africa. And... Uh, so I was born and grew up there. I did my primary and secondary education there. And uh, I came to the United States uh, in 2010 to pursue, a, uh, to pursue a, uh, a, an undergraduate career. I studied political science and, uh, and I minored in philosophy at the Catholic University of America. And then I got my master's degree at the George Washington University. And uh, I studied political management there. I graduated in 2017. And in 2018, I published my first book. And since then, I've been writing books. And I'm also uh, working in professional capacity as a data analyst uh, remotely for a company based in Utah. All right, Germinal. Yes, and you also have many academic articles. You are on a roll. Yes. What is that? No, I said you also ha have several academic articles. You are on a roll. Yes. Yes, you are on a roll. So you wrote two pieces for Midas.org. Well, more than two, but I really like these two. And one is titled Growth and Income Inequality in Africa. Germinal, you yeah. refer to two types of income inequality. Income inequality driven by a private sector economy and income inequality driven by corruption or rent seeking. Explain these types yeah. of inequality. So, yeah, it's, it's very straightforward. So the one created by the private sector is what I call healthy inequality. And the reason why I call this wealthy inequality is because you have uh, private, so you have individuals uh, working in private capacity, managing their own resources. So as we are individuals, we have a unique set of skills that are proper to us. And therefore we manage our resources as we see fit. And because we're not the same, Therefore, our management style are different. And because our management style are different, therefore we're gonna have different outcomes. And it's all a matter of choices. So you have, and that's why you have some entrepreneurs who are highly successful, who are millionaires and billionaires, and you have some entrepreneurs who fail. You know, uh, I mean, it's a combination of many things. Like you have the market, you have the, the management team and everything, but it's a combination of things. But the bottom line is that based on how you manage your own resources, you get the outcome of that management style. So those who manage their resources diligently will get high results. They get high reward because they've been taking more risk. And those who mismanage their resources where you know, not get those high rewards or they may even fail. So that creates inequality. So that inequality in the private sector is that everyone has the same opportunity but do not get the same results. This is healthy. And then you have inequality in the public sector, which we call rent seeking. So rent seeking is basically, uh, it's basically the members of the public sector who increase their personal wealth without creating wealth for society as a whole. And inequality in that sector is unhealthy. And the reason why it's unhealthy because the, the public sector does not create, it doesn't produce. The, the money that the, uh, the public sector use to conduct its activities are based on tax, but and the taxes they collect are from the disposable or from the, the income, from the gross income of each individual who are contributing to the creation of wealth in society. So the people who work in the public sector then enrich themselves 
they impose a set of laws on society that they're that they're not subject to themselves. So they're not sub subjected to those laws themselves, but every one of us is. So you can see this uh, type of inequality, for instance, during the existence of, of the Soviet Union in former Russia. Uh, you, you see the members of the Politburo who were very wealthy, they were driving in luxury cars. And then you have the rest of the population who live in absolute poverty. So those people, the members of the Politburo, so the members of the bureaucracy, are basically using public resources to, to, to enrich themselves. And then the people who are creating those resources, the people who are using those resources to create the riches and wealth that society knows are not benefiting from it. That's the problem with unhealthy inequality. And you only find that kind of unhealthy inequality in the public sector. Yes, and, and Germinal, you also referenced the interesting case of the Central African Republic. And you're right, the Central African Republic as one of the lowest human development in indexes in Africa because its degree of income inequality is preventing its economy from, from flourishing. Tell us a little more about inequality in the Central African Republic. I mean, I, I simply chose the Central African Republic because it's one of the I have, because the inequality there is the same as the one I said about the Soviet Union. It's basically the same. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with the story of uh, Jean Bédel Bokassa. Yes, 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 I am. So, yeah, so basically everyone knows about the Central African Republic because of it. So, yeah, very famous, notorious political leader who basically stole the entire country's wealth to make it his personal fortune. And then he, uh, he had that uh, grotesque ceremony uh, crowning himself as the new emperor of, of Central Africa, like during Napoleon in the 19th century. So... Yeah, so um, yeah, it's a, uh, but it's the same as the Soviet Union. Is that the Central African Republic government was using public resources to enrich themselves while the population was poor? That's what it comes down to. And every country that uh, that has used this uh, this approach has been poor. When you look at even Venezuela today, specifically under the rule of Hugo Chavez and, uh, and Maduro, uh, you see that the members of the government of Chavez were getting richer and richer. But because the Chavez government uh, nationalized all businesses, the ordinary citizen has nothing else for himself. Whatever they produce is for the state. Whatever they do is for the state. But the people who work for the state, so the people who are running, conducting the state, are getting richer, while those who are producing for the state are not. That's a real inequality that people refuse to, to acknowledge. And you see, you only see that kind of inequality in socialist states, in, in countries that, uh, that embrace socialism. Uh, all right, German, Germinal, and let me read this excerpt from your piece, The Lack of Rule of Law and an Effective Administration of Justice Impedes Access to Private Property that is Legally and Physically Secure. The high degree of corruption that reigns in the Central African Republic disincentivizes the, lay, the layman from creating wealth and improving his living standards as well as that of his fellow men. I think that this part of the essay is quite crucial for the audience. The role of corruption and an and, and ineffective justice system in impeding human capital formation and wealth creation. I didn't hear the last part you said. Yeah, I, I, that, I think that this part of your essay is important for our audience because it elucidates the role of an ineffective justice system and corruption in deterring human capital formation and wealth formation. Yes, yes. And, and that's what it is because 
as I said, like it all it all come back to the same thing. As I said, you know, in countries like uh, Sierra Leone or uh, Burundi or uh, Central African Republic, there is high corruption because there is no rule of law. So the people, as I said earlier, the people who are ruling the government do not impose the laws on themselves. They do not hold, they do not hold themselves accountable before the rule of law. That's why it, it that's why it creates such inequalities. And I take again the example of the Soviet Union. The people who were working in the Politburo did not hold themselves accountable before the rule of law. If a Soviet, if an ordinary Soviet uh, citizen breaks the law, try to start a side business, why he's not allowed, he will get the death penalty for that. But if a member of the Politburo decides to start a business, no one will know about it because he's the one ruling the government. So he will make money and, but what he's doing is illegal because the law says the Soviet Union don't run a business and he's doing it. But because he, he runs for the, he, he rules uh, the government because he's part of the government, so the law doesn't apply to him. So there is no effective justice system yeah. in those countries. Yes, Germinal. And remember, the private entrepreneurs require a justice system that is efficient, impartial, and predictable. And if the justice yes. system is, is lacking, they're less likely to invest. And if they don't invest, right. people are less likely to be employed, and the gap between the rich and the poor will increase. Because as you rightly noted, those in the public sector and the private sector who are corrupt, they benefit from rent-seeking activities. Yes. Absolutely. So I, I and, and and this is what's driving income inequality in many poor countries. It's not the free market or property rights. No, it's not. Yes. It's the, you uh, may go uh, ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm, I said you may go ahead and continue. No, I was saying yeah, it's, it's the lack of uh, effective judicial system. You know, it's yeah, it's uh, people because. Especially in African countries, we we do not have the culture of the rule of law. It's it, that's a problem because when you look at, I'm going to center on Africa here for for a moment. When you look at uh, African countries, right? They all, most of them, got their independence in 1960. Yeah, in the 1960s. But, yeah, but. Uh, when they got the independence, all of them were dictatorships. All of them. The, it was they were all one-party systems. There was no uh, multi-party systems in Africa until the 1990s. Every country in Africa was a one-party system. So the party that is ruling the country, how how do you hope? that they're going to have a very effective judicial system that all the members of that party accountable for the law. It's impossible. They're the one ruling the country. They're the one putting all the judges in, in their Supreme Court. So the judges are just applying the legislation. They're not applying the law. That, 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 that's the thing. So we, 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 in most African countries, that's what it's like. We don't have a culture of the rule of law. It's something that we, we, we just wrote theoretically in our constitutions, but we never applied it. That's the problem. Yes. We never it. We're just having the constitution for theoretical discussion, but that's about it. After, in, in Nigeria today, there is a multi-party system, but for the most part, you are right, in the average country in Africa, there was either a list, there, there was either dictatorship or one party dominated the country for several years. But Swana is an exception, is that the ruling party in Botswana was actually effective. So in that regard, Botswana is a bit different. Hello? 
Can you repeat your question? Yeah, no, I, I was saying that Botswana is a bit different in Africa because the ruling party in, in, in Botswana was effective. Yes, absolutely. It was effective. And, it, it, and I think it's also a cultural thing in Southern Africa because even if you look at South Africa itself, the country in South Africa, despite the apartheid and all the gross things that has happened during that regime, South Africans have developed a culture for the rule of law. You feel much safer to invest in South Africa than you would in another African country, let's say some Central, Central African Republic. Because in South Africa, you have a rule of law. If you lose your property, you can rely on the judicial system to adjudicate that dispute and restore whatever you own. And you won't find that in a country like Central African Republic because their legal system is completely distorted. Yes, but unfortunately, some of the gains in South Africa are being reversed. Yeah, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, and it's, it's totally true. It's been reversed, and I hope it will not continue uh, on that path. <laughs> I really hope so, because it is worrisome. It's true. Yeah, the, the middle class is shrinking in, in South Africa. Racial tensions, again, are on the horizon. I think that South Africa needs to remain committed to reducing tensions, economic freedom, and long-term prosperity, and put politics aside. Well, I, I, I hope so too. I hope they do that too. I hope, I hope so too. Because politics is very divisive. Politics divides people. It doesn't unite people. That, that, and, and, and people are emotionally invested in politics. That's a problem. Politics, germinal, is not really about growth and development. It's a popularity context. It's about resources and who gets what. So if you are serious, people who are serious about policy and growth and development are good managers, but not necessarily good politicians. Yeah. So I, yeah. I'm, I, I am more of a policy person than a political person. I think that politics is boring. Me too, and I totally agree with you. Yes, me too. I am very a policy oriented person than a than politics. Although I studied politics, I even wanted to be a politician. Me too. I wanted to be a politician, but not anymore. No, not at all. Right. <laughs> me too. This is funny. Because look, most people like us who are interested in politics, want to, we want to make a substantive change. But the reality is that politics is not a reform movement. It is closer to entertainment and popularity. And sometimes in, 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 in politics, to achieve your goal, one has to compromise and even engage in dishonest activities. So for people like us who care more about productivity and economic growth, we prefer to work in the private sector or the world of ideas. Yeah. Yeah, so, no. yeah because, so for example, you going to, you enter politics in Africa, America, or anywhere, you're, you're interested in, in reform germinal, but look at the state of politics in Africa or even in America. It's gridlock. People who speak the truth and honestly, they don't win elections. Yeah, I mean, you're not the thing with politics is that you're not supposed to, to to tell the truth. People don't because people don't want the truth. They don't want to hear. It. Yes, that's the thing. They, they want to be told that 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 they're unable to progress in society because of an external agent. And for them to succeed, the government must rid the state of that external agent. That's what people like to, to hear. These are the appealing views that they sound palatable. No one wants to be told that the state will reduce regulations and taxes, but in order for these policies to, to work, you must work hard. People don't want to hear that. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing people want to, people still want to, uh, they still want to think that 
the political system is the system through which they can achieve economic salvation. And that's not the case. It's politics has never improved the lives of people. Economic does. And economic deals with non-coercive uh, systems, basically markets. A market is a non-coercive institution. So, uh, and that's where like, and it's in that institution that people go into and are able to create wealth for society. Politics is by nature coercive because it deals with law, it deals with what you're not supposed to do. And if you do it, it's what will happen to you. That's what politics is about. And politics is susceptible to rent seeking activities and lobbying. A perfect example, the United States of America. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, because poly politicians are not in the productive economy. They need taxes and the support of businessmen. And one way for them to increase their earnings is to pass laws to, to prefer their colleagues in the private sector who refuse to compete. Yeah. Yeah, po 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 politics is, 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 a, is a dirty game. We could spend the entire conversation talking about politics, but we're going to move on and discuss your second piece. And your second piece is titled, Even Partial Liberalization Can Save a Nation from Poverty. And you start by stating what is obvious to those who observe economic trends. The rise of China was driven by the free market when the state opened market resources in the in the 1980s and late 70s not because not industrial policy and this is how you start your piece by saying that the remarkable economic surge of china since the 1980s is based on the relatively liberal p p policies of the then administration who prioritized at least some limited access to property rights as the basis of china's economic growth this is this is one of the, the, the bigger myths of the, the 21st century germinal that the growth of China is based on industrial policy. Yeah. Yeah, the 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 the, 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 the China the Ch China didn't <laughs> become the, the second world power because of statism. Even today the state owned the state owned enterprises in China are woefully ineffective and less innovative than private sector companies in China and in the West. And the reason why state-owned enterprise are always ineffective compared to private sector is because state-owned enterprise have nothing to lose. They have not been what? What's it? They said state-owned enterprises have not been what? They have nothing to lose. Okay. Yes, they, yeah, they have not been able care? to. Why would you care if you have nothing to lose? <laughs> That's the thing. They have nothing to lose. So why are you going to, to provide effort if, you know, the outcome doesn't matter? The private sector has everything to lose. That's why they're effective. Because if they're not producing, they will not make profit. But the public sector, state-owned enterprise, they don't need profit. Their, their profit is based on regulation. So the more regulations they have, the more power they have. That's how they make their profit. Germinal, your point is so simplistic, but at the same time dynamic. You're right. If you don't have anything to lose, you're not going to innovate. Yeah, it's, it's very simple. They have nothing to lose. Like, and that has been everywhere. The state or enterprise, the public sector has nothing to lose. And when, whenever they, that's why they mismanage resources because the resources they manage is not their own. The state doesn't have its own resources. The resources that the state manage is the resources of the collectivity of everyone. So if you manage, let's say, 
Now let me put it this way. Only you know what, what is best for you in order to incur your growth, right? But if, let's say, I put my resources, you put your resources, and then we have a few other friends that put their resources, we all put together. If, if things go wrong, who is responsible? We, because we're assuming the risk. It's our capital. No, but, the, but the thing is that no one is responsible because we put everything together. So oh, no oh, oh, I get your point. No, sorry. I, I thought you were referring to, to private entrepreneurs. You're referring to collective ownership of assets. Okay, I get your point. When everything is put in together, no one is responsible. But when it's your thing, you are responsible for it. So you will make sure that your actions pertain towards the effectiveness of the resources that you manage. You will do everything you can to avoid losses. It's but just... when things are put effectively, when everything is put together, no one cares. No one will bear the responsibility. If things go wrong, say, oh, it's not me. Oh, no, it's not my problem. No, I didn't do that. Exactly. That, 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 and, and, and that's how, and that's how the, the, the state behaves. Because the state, whenever the state implements a policy that fails, what they say, oh, we didn't have enough resources. That's why it fails. So what they do, they pass another legislation that will come and do CPR on the legislation that fails. That's the thing. So they say, oh, we need more resources to compensate for what has happened earlier. And then it goes into that vicious cycle of uh, we go from regulation to regulation, so from intervention to intervention, and it never ends. And then the, the motives of a state-owned enterprise are, are, are different from, the, from those of a private enterprise. State-owned enterprises are not driven by the profit motive. Yeah, they're not. They're, they're, they're driven by the motive of gaining more political power. Because that's what I was saying. For the state to be relevant, the policy has to fail. I'm not saying that they do that on purpose necessarily, but the policy has to fail. Because if it fails, that's when they say, okay, it fails. Like You guys need us to implement new policies that would be better than the previous one. But, see, but if everything is working fine, the state becomes irrelevant. So imagine all the people who are working for the state, what they're going to be doing. Oh, right? Yeah, I, it's, I, human I, I, it's human beings that are working for the state too. They, they're not machines, they're human beings. Those people will be out of jobs if whatever policy we implement is working. They become useless. You're, you're right, Germ Germinal. So in order for the state to prevent itself from becoming redundant, it must fail. And this is quite obvious. If the, the private sector is a better alternative to the state, but if we invest in the private sector, the, 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 the role of, polit of, of a politician will become less important. We need less politicians. Exactly. Exactly. It, it's just like... basically become irrelevant. Absolutely. Germinal, that's it's just... Why, that, 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 that's why politicians, in all of their talks, they always portray themselves as the guy who has the solution to your problem. <coughs> Germinal, if we're being pragmatic, the truth is that a country only needs a, a competent leader and a cabinet. Most people can manage themselves. And if the economy is designed to, 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 to reap economic rewards, then we don't need to rely on, on political representatives. We can solve our own problems. If government agencies are effective, we don't need to call the political representative to tell him to impose pressure on the government agency to perform. So he's redundant. Yes, it is redundant. And, it's big, and, the, and the bottom line of that is because they don't have the profit motive. The profit motive is absent. That's why the government doesn't care. That's why that's what I'm saying. They have nothing to do. Yeah, like I've always said, like I live in, Jam in Jamaica and I've always said, Jam Jam Jamaica is a small country. It can afford a prime minister and a competent cabinet, but we don't need MPs and councillors. And she's public knowledge that many of these councillors and MPs are ineffective. We need 
competent ministers and competent government agencies. When we get rid of MPs and councillors, we'll save money. They're not needed. Yeah, totally. I agree with you. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not needed. And so many people are unwilling to believe in their own potential to succeed without the, the, the government. No, because, absolutely. Because the truth is, Germina, that we're already compelled to work hard without government pressure. It's a, it's a mirage that we need politicians and the government. You get up in the morning, you go to work, you pay your bills, and you, and you live a productive life without political interference. You don't need to vote. I, I'm not a big fan of voting. If we're going to have a state, we only need a, a president, a cabinet, and, a, and, and relevant government agencies. That's all, nothing else. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. I agree. But, but, but most people like, most people germinal are not like us. They don't get it. They don't, and I think some of them they refuse to get it. Yes. Because they, they have to put effort and people don't want to put effort. Exactly. It, that's, that's the point. People like me and you, Germinal, were willing to exert control over our lives. Yes. That's the, the, the point. And, but unfortunately, some, too many of us are hostile to freedom. No, Germinal, we're going to discuss the fascinating case of R Rwanda. And you're right. The African continent is probably the most well-equipped region in the world in terms of natural resources. It contains an enormous number of subsoil assets such as uranium, bauxite, manganese, gold, silver, iron, etc., as well as the commodities necessary for agricultural production. Furthermore, the African continent has the fastest growing population in the world after China, after China and, in, and India. <coughs> But in order to tap into this potential, an economy must be liberalized. And the most advanced economies in Africa are those that have been that, that have liberalized the most. For example, Rwanda has freed up its economy significantly over the past 20 years. I, I think Rwanda is an interesting case study. Yes, it is, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> people, people may not like the leadership of Paul the Paul Kagame, but as but at least his head is on his body, and the truth is, and the true true German is that I'm not in favor of dictatorships. But if a dictator dictator is willing to commit to economic freedom, the economy will still grow. Absolutely, and that's what's happening. I personally have no problem with Kagame's leadership. <laughs> Absolutely, have no problem with leadership. One that came from a from a bloodbath in 1994, they have to reconstruct the country. You're not going to come and bring a democracy where people will be fighting each other all the time. Democracy is not something, it's a very difficult system to implement. That's what people don't realize. Because democracy requires people to adjust their behavior to a system, to, to a system that is not even part of their initial culture. Democracy is not a it's not a system that I think is compatible with African culture. In Africa, we believe in the chief. Whatever the chief says, we believe in his wisdom. That's what it is. It has always been like that. That's why in Africa, the African culture, the black culture will always respect the authority of the elders. There's a reason for that. And when we take the case of Rwanda with Kagame, Kagame here is the elder. He's the wise guy. I'm not saying whatever he says, he says or does is perfect. But Kagame understood that if I decide to put uh, political freedom, it's going to destabilize the, the, the it's going to, to destabilize the peace. I choose economic freedom over political freedom. Yes. Economic freedom is. predicts growth, not democracies. And it's the same thing in China too. That's why China has, has grown. Because in China, what they did was they implement economic freedom but not political freedom. And personally, I prefer economic freedom over political freedom. 
me too so like i'm i'm a writer like yourself i i like to, to write and express ideas but many of my pieces are abstract so if i were to reside in a country that that clamps down on economic freedom i wouldn't really be affected because i'm writing mainly abstract pieces and and secondly germinal with the exception of revolutionaries who are re who are resisting totalitarian ideas most people are not that interested in philosophy and commentary. So from a cost benefit analysis, economic freedom is obviously superior to political freedom. And the evidence on the relationship between democracy and economic growth is not clear cut. Many economists based on various studies do agree that democracy doesn't cause growth. J James Robinson is a bit different. He, give, he, he, he confers the edge to democracy and maybe to an extent he is right. If, the, if a democratic power is willing to promote I ideas that facilitate the, the widespread collaboration of, I of, of innovation and, and knowledge transfer, this is a positive for democracy. And author a dictatorship can be authoritarian. So if the idea is positive but contradicts the dictatorship, that idea will be blocked. So in some cases, a democracy can be superior to a dictatorship, but a democracy is not necessary for economic growth. And secondly, there's a difference between democracy and freedom. Democracy is not a substitute for freedom. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes. No, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, I, I think you should get more into like empirical work rather than theoretical work. You, you, uh, because I have to be honest, like theory is good, but no one cares. Yes. When when the, the when your paper is too abstract, people are like, yo, what are you talking about? Okay. I, hold on. I do no. cite empirical studies, but I, I like to explain the theory before I cite the data. It doesn't matter. Theory is is just storytelling. You know, you're just telling the story. But when you 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 focus on empirical evidence using the data facts to back your arguments, people can go and build up and be like, okay, yeah, what you guys, what these guys talking about makes sense. It's uh it's more impactful than theory. Of course, like, don't get me wrong, like, theory is important, but uh, you won't achieve anything concrete, anything tangible with theory. No, 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 don't get me wrong. I do cite empirical studies, but I I also believe that as we established earlier, humans are emotional and sentimental creatures. So a theoretical perspective is always a plus. Yeah. I, I, I am driven by data, but many are not driven by data. And they still, ex they still expose support for Marxism and socialism, despite the fact that the data and, me and, and, and many studies have been contradicting Marxism and socialism. It's just like the argument that free markets are negative for environmental prosper prosperity. According to the actual evidence, there's a positive relationship between free markets and environmental success. But yet people are still writing articles that capitalism is causing environmental degradation. Why? Because of a particular theoretical position. Capitalism is maligned as a villain. So people on the right, yes, the, the right is, I'm on the right and I'm data driven. People on the right, they always need data. I, I like data, but at, although I'm not really emotional, one has to ensure that he's able to appeal to the sentiments of people because people are emotional and sentimental creatures. I see. Okay. I understand. Yeah. Yes. So, but but when when I when I say that my <coughs> articles are abstract, I'm I I am referring to the policy sense. So, for example, I will write an article on entrepreneurship. We are most people are not going to censor our piece on entrepreneurship. That's that's just the, the, the reality. I'm less likely to write a piece criticizing a politician because I don't think that they're that important. Mm, okay, I see. Yeah, and 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 in the, the long run, they can't affect your individual choices or success. They, your your success is only linked to politics if you decide to engage in rent seeking. And neither of us are approaching that route. Yeah, but yeah, R R R Rwanda is an interesting case study, and so is Botswana. Germinal, you, you have a new. I, I I read your work, and you have a new paper titled "Property Rights and Income Inequality." 
published by Germinal Van. And you're looking at the relationship between pro progressive, progressive income tax, property rights, and, in and inequality, and what is necessary for low, for, for low inequality. And the, you write in the abstract, this paper argues that income inequality is a normal, natural, and mandatory characteristic for the economic development of society. This paper intends to demonstrate that income inequality is not in inherently a predicament, predicament for the, econom the economic evolution of the citizens, the citizens, the citizen century, but a necessary condition to ensure growth. Tell us a little about this piece, Germinal, just briefly. Uh, I'm trying to open this piece. Yeah. So we're gonna go over all my all my papers. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's property rights and income inequality. Yes. Okay. So in this paper, what I did was that I I uh, I performed a statistical analysis uh, measuring the impact of property rights on on income, and I picked the most advanced countries in the world, and when I performed the regression. I saw that there is a strong correlation between uh, property rights index and income per capita. So the more, so the higher is your property rights index, the higher becomes your income per capita. Yes. So the correlation shows that there is like a 70% uh, relationship between the two. And then when you look at, and then I made a comparison between uh, Luxembourg and Sierra Leone because they're two small countries. But you see that in a country like, like Luxembourg, uh, they have income per capita, which is like 100 and, uh, $115,000 per person compared to Sierra Leone where it's, uh, I don't know, like $300 per person. It's a huge difference. And yet both countries are small geographically. And you realize that in fact it's because when you have the rule of law that, that protects private property in, in a country, investment increase, human capital increase, production increase. So when all these factors increase, your income is going to increase as well. That's why advanced countries are advanced yes germinal and i also agree with the conclusion income inequality is a natural form of a productive productive society it is not a negative and in the long run property rights increase income so we should care about the objective standing of people and not the relative standing yes and germinal there's also another interesting piece published by you titled Property Rights and Economic Freedom. And this relationship is more clear cut. You contend that property rights lead to economic freedom and economic freedom improves wealth. And it, it was yes. applied to Africa. Yes. It's basically what it's similar to what I wrote about the Mrs. Institute. Like, uh, one of my pieces in the Mrs. Institute. It's basically the same. Um, it's the same premises. The only difference is that that piece we're talking about is more. Uh, it's more. It's more um, empirical. It's more about econometric, but it's the same. It's basically the same premise. Yes, and Germinal. I, I I must belabor the point that economic freedom. Is significant because usually when when not you but some people when they mention capitalism they're only referring to big corporations they're not discussing the role of ordinary people 
who are integrated in, in market spaces and what they can achieve when the government permits economic freedom? Yeah. Because cap, we, are, we are the capitalists, we're in the free market space. So if there's no occupational licensing regulation, this is a benefit for, for, for workers. This is economic freedom and it in, improves our social status, income and well-being. Mm -hmm. and, and what is also usually ignored is that there are some equal countries that are very poor, like Ethiopia. Well, interestingly, Ethiopia is no longer poor like it used. Well, the economy had, had recorded gro growth, but relative to, to many countries, it, Ethiopia is still struggling. Sure, yeah, we can see it to some extent, but compared to the 1990s when they used to show on TV, like people starving to death to the point that you see their... their you know, like the bones and stuff, like this is no longer the case. I'm not saying that Ethiopia is like super rich or anything, but uh, they've made a lot of progress. Like they're doing pretty fine economically. Like there's been a lot of economic progress going on. Yes, and, and I just hope that the progress is not reversed by conflict. I was having a conversation with an, an ambassador and we discussed Africa, Ethiopia, and, and, and conflict. I hope that Ethiopia does not succumb to sustained conflict because that would reverse economic gains. Yeah. So Germinal, you're so impressive. You have several books. I, we won't talk about all of them, but one particular book, <laughs> it piques my interest. The Economic Condition of Black America in the 20th Century. Tell us a little about this book. As I said, Germinal, this show is centered on the guest. So feel free to talk about your work and promote yourself. I have no problem with you promoting your books. It's this, this show is not about me, it's about the guests. So go ahead. Tell us a little about this book. Uh, well, I mean, I just wanted to understand why uh, why the black community in America is the poorest community in the 21st century in the US. So I understood that in order to, uh, to understand what's going on today, then you need to do a historical analysis of what happened in the century and even the century before that. So that's what I did. Uh, the, the, the introduction basically glanced at the 19th, at the, at the economic condition of Black people in the 19th century. So it starts pretty much even during the time of slavery, where there were some Blacks that were pretty wealthy in the North, despite the fact that slavery was going on. Uh, and, uh, and then the book goes into the first part of the 20th century. So I divide the book into four parts. The first part deals from 1900 until uh, World War World War Two, and then the second part is from uh, World War Two until the 1970s. So I talk about 1950, 1960, 1970s. And the third part I talk about the war on drugs on black people. And then the fourth part, I talk about the walk, uh, the, the, the uh, how we call it, uh, the crime bill in 1992. So in the 1990s, how mass incarceration increased in the black community. And basically, the whole, the, the, the premise of the book is that black people are, in America are poor because government made them poor. It wasn't the market. In fact, in the book, I trace that whenever there were policies that favored deregulation, the income of Black people increased. Black people had more freedom to create businesses, to create uh, value, to bring value, to create wealth. But then when they had like policies that were more strict, more regulated, it 
distorted the black community. I even talk also about the welfare state, how the welfare state in fact destroyed the black family unit, how they create policies that will encourage women to be single so that they can collect more money and in the meantime claim that they're not married and then their the, the man goes to prison and that that increased crime because single women could not uh they were not able to take care of many children specifically from different fathers and then those kids, they were not like, you know, guided. They, there was there was no one to tell them, hey, do, do your homework, have this attitude and et cetera. So those kids were living on their own, basically. Yes. And, and what happened was that it increased crime. It increased crime and poverty because those kids were pretty much doomed. Children need both parents, their mother and their father. and. Many studies, one popular study was done by Glazer years ago, and many studies argue that there's a relationship between single female headed households and criminality. And this is one of the reasons why urban areas are often besetted by crime because of the high prevalence of single head headed households. And this is a problem in, in, in the Black community, as we should know by now. Bradford Wilcox, he has a new paper out. And what I like about it is that they compare working class boys to working class Blacks. And to, dis, to diminish the salience of racism, because racism is not the cause of all problems, they argue that working class Blacks were raised in stable in stable families, financially, they're better than their working class white peers were not raised in stable families. Yeah. Yeah, because in fact, marriage is a very important economic tool to escape on. Yes. When, yes. when you're married, uh, you have a higher chance to avoid being poor than if you're single and you have a kid. It, it, it gets complicated. Yes, like the, the research of Isabel Sawhill asserts that stable families produce an even bigger boost to black families. And this is obvious, they're coming from a lower base. Yeah. And, and, and marriage is responsible for pacifying men. Mar married men are less likely to commit crime. They, they abuse drugs less and they take less silly risk because they have to they have to think about their families and the future. Yes, indeed. And the Germinal, you also, well, you, you have several books, but I, I, I think I, I, I'm going to buy some of them, especially this one. This yeah. may, I, I'm yet to read it, but I think that it may be your best written book, although I'm yet to read it. And it is titled Income, Inequality, and Economics. Tell you us about it. Yeah, I, I'm yet to read it, but I, I, I'm looking at the summary and I really like it. And I think it's great. Well, I mean, uh, it's interesting because I think my best work so far, according to the data, is the book we just talked about, The Economic Condition of Black America. Uh, it's the one that sold the most, it's the one that has the most reviews. It's interesting that you think income inequality and economics is my best written work. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm yet to read it, but let me tell you why this work is, is quite fascinating. The, black, the, 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 the work on Black America obviously sold copies because people like to talk about Black Americans. So it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an appealing title. If you want to make money, you yeah. title the book Black America, the, the condition of Black Americans. But income inequality and economics Germinal, you should not underestimate this book because I, I meant to read it, but I must admit that you rigorously show the causes of income inequality and intergroup gaps in, in wealth. And this is why it's important. I appreciate that. Thank you. That means a lot. Yes. So for, so for example, I, I, I keep belaboring the point that Americans rarely talk about intragroup inequality. So, so in the Asian... American community, 
income inequality is a big problem. In the black community, income inequality is a, is a problem. Americans fixate on income inequality across races and group, but they don't look at intra-group inequality. Yeah. And <laughs> what, what, what's, the true, what, what, what's the true cause of inequality? Is it really about class or about race? What, what's going on? Most people are, are, are approaching it on a superficial level, but I've been talking enough. Tell us a little about the, the book we're talking about now. Don't be humble, promote it. You mean the book on income inequality? Yeah, yeah yes. Promote it. As I said, the, the, the show is about the guests, so feel free to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, no, I want you to read it. I'm not going to promote this one. I want you to read it first. Okay, 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 Germinal. Don't tell me you're underestimating the book. No, I'm not underestimating it. I want you to read it and come back to me with feedback. All right. I, 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 I will definitely do so. But as I said, we're going to wrap up soon, but we, we have the conversation and I think that people should purchase your work. I'm not one to be grudge talented people. So for this, for the last segment, we're going to be talking about your books. So, and there's another one I like, limited government and political decentralization and economic mm. approach to politics. And look, we're talking about politics. So all the books that I've been mentioning are quite relevant for the purposes of this discussion. Okay. What, what's this book about? Limited government and political centralization. Well, I mean, let me ask you this. When you look at the, the title, what do you think the book is about? Well, I, I asked you that question so you could speak about it for the audience, but limit government and political decentralization and economic approach to politics. I, I, I guess you're, you're elaborating the case as to why we need a decentralized political system and the economic benefits of such a political system. Indeed, you're right. So basically in, so basically in the book, what I do is that I explain why government is by nature limited. Why government is by nature what? Limited. Okay. Why the role of government is by nature limited? Because government is big today. The government is kind of doing everything. So in the book, I went with the approach of explaining why government exists and why and what is the role of its existence. And I and I said that government exists to grant us the legal access to economic resources so we can create and produce goods and services and wealth for society as a whole. So the role of government is simply to ensure that our right to property are respected and upheld. So if the role of government is simply to do that, therefore it is limited. It is limited. But I say this is if society decides to embrace first a market economy. So in a market economy, the role of, of government is by essence limited. But if you have a society that would rather have a planned economy, therefore the role of government will be bigger. And I say that when you have a government, or sorry, a, a, a society where the role of government is limited, it creates more prosperity as a whole for everyone, including for the, the, the poor, for the most poor people. All right. So, Germinal, I won't ask you to give a brief lecture on other books, but some of the, the uh, some other titles that I find to be fascin fascinating are Classical Liberalism in Africa. This is another book that I'm going to be promoting. And you, you also have a book titled The African Nobel Prize, A Driver for Development. So you don't need to speak about these books, but I'm promoting them because I think that, they're, that such books are interesting. And remember, Germinal, the free market is not a zero-sum game. I can win and you can win. And if I promote you to ensure that you win, it doesn't mean that I'm going to lose. Yeah, of course. Yes. So I, 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 I'm just, it's, not, it's just not in me to, to, be, to, to begrudge people. I think that's a sign of 
low intelligence. Because if you are intelligent, you should have the capacity to create several opportunities. So if I yeah, promote exactly. yeah, if I promote your work and you grow, I can always grow because I have a fertile brain. Yeah. But terminal, I I'm enjoying the conversation, but unfortunately we have to wrap up. But it, it's a it's a pleasure to speak to you, Germinal. And I I, I, I interviewed Dumo Denga and now I'm interviewing you. And Dumo Denga interviewed me. And I'm planning to have a conversation for the for 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 the for the trio so all of us can get together on my channel and we talk about black intellectual issues. Okay, well, yeah, someday when I have like the yeah, freer time, sure. Be, yes. Be yeah, I, I, I already share. I are I already shared the correspondence with Dumo, and he agrees. But it's a pleasure speaking to you. But unfortunately, I have to go. So bye. No problem. Thank you very much. All right. No.